I'm uh, Mikola Maksimenko. I'm from SoftSurf, I'm where I lead the R&D lab. And SoftSurf is a global technology consulting company. And at a glance, we have more than 8,000 associates, and we work in different verticals, from retail to healthcare, where we apply various advanced technology from IoT to blockchain and to artificial intelligence, and we actually help our clients to navigate in the future how to use these advanced technologies. And important aspect in the fact that we work in different verticals is that we actually can spot uh, interesting technology applications in one vertical and transfer this knowledge to another vertical. So, uh, in this respect, we actually see that we have very nice uh, net promoter scores, so actually clients love to, to work with us. And, uh, and we actually are able to solve really challenging, uh, challenging questions for our clients. So today I'm going to focus on the drug discovery pipeline that we recently started to work on. So uh, in, uh, in, in short, uh, in few sentences, so we know that drug discovery is very complex and costly process, so it takes more than a decade to develop a new drug. And the, the majority of uh, issues come on the, on the clinical trials phase, where we see that 95% of drugs actually fail to, to achieve the FDA approval. So what, what actually we want to improve is the initial phase of proposing these new candidates such that these new candidates could actually, so we can improve the rate of further clinical trial success. So in this respect, we, we fo will focus in this talk on, the, on this first initial part. And I want also to emphasize that to increase the success rate and in, to improve this pipeline, it's not always necessary to focus on only on artificial intelligence because it's not always the silver bullet. So as, as, we, as we already heard in the uh, panel discussion in the morning in the first talk, it's also very important to look on the data pipelines that we have in this process and the way we organize and manage this data between different groups who are involved in this process. Because over the 15 years, technologies change, people change, and maybe even locations change. So it's, and what we see also across different verticals, so we see that uh, in, in the way we treat data, we need to, to, be, to have different level of maturity. So the, at the very beginning, we actually need to organize and gain insights from data. Uh, and only on the next levels, we can speed up our organizations with this data. And only finally, we can apply machine learning to gain the competitive advantage by using the insights from this data. And in terms, of, uh, in terms of this talk, I will focus, of course, on artificial intelligence, but we always need to keep in mind that actual infrastructure that we are dealing with, in particular in pharma where the data is sparse, where the data sources are coming from different uh, sources, so we actually need to, to be very much aware of that. And AI uh, for drug discovery, it gives us a lot of advantage. So we can do uh, excellent pattern recognition, and particularly with recent uh, developments in deep learning. We can have an excellent predictive power of these systems. So sometimes competing with intuition of the human. And this, this was really nicely seen by the game of Go, where, uh, the, where the deep neural network can actually beat the human. And finally, we see really nice advantage in the generative power of AI. So these images of faces that you see on the background, they actually are not real. So it's generated by the deep neural network. And that's uh, something that we also work in our lab on, on the aspect of computer vision. And we, we realize that we can use these systems in the different domains. For example, in this case, for generating new molecular structures or new, or new materials. So in terms of... Uh, Machine learning for drug discovery, people already use this different power in different aspects for uh, various stages of the drug discovery pipeline. From actually uh, drug discovery and proposing new targets or new candidates to uh, post-marketing studies. And in my talk, I will focus actually on the beginning of this pipeline on actually how to use generative uh, machine learning models to generate new drug candidates and how to predict their properties and generate candidates with particular properties. So 
th this, uh, this interest in, uh, in AI-assisted uh, gen generation of drugs, it comes from the recent years. So people used computational modeling for, for ages already. But in the uh, last few years, we see uh, a huge progress in, um, in so-called generative adversarial neural networks and various other uh, generative uh, machine learning models. And particular idea in these models is in the fact that you can actually have uh, represent discrete data in the form of continuous vector. And in this new space, you can actually move continuously from one point to another. And each point in this space will represent a new structure. So if you, if you train these models along with the properties end to end, you can actually uh, map your continuous space to different regions where various regions will actually represent uh, drugs or, mo or structures with various uh, other properties. So in that sense, instead of actually searching for a needle in the haystack, you actually can immediately generate these needles or immediately generate molecules with particular properties that you, you are interested in. So the questions that arise immediately could be, uh, but how, will, how physical uh, and valid would be these structures? So not necessary that in the, if you have a sparse chemical space, that different points which actually are in between known non-molecules would be actually physical and relevant. Then how do, how do apply this, the same technique to small data sets when we, when we are very much limited in the available data and we cannot do end-to-end -end learning with having large data sets of structures along with the properties? Uh, how can we control the properties and how we can enhance the number of unique structures here? So for this, I, I, gave you, I gave you a, a example pipeline that we played with. So we, we decided to go not end to end. However, we experimented with that as well. We actually decided to uh, train different blocks of this pipeline on the separate data sets which act to actually maximize the efficiency of uh, individual blocks. So in, in this sense, we have so-called generative block here, which actually generates uh, the molecule. We have uh, separate sampling in the embedding space. We then have a predictor which actually allows us, or a set of predictors which allows us to generate uh, and control properties of particular uh, structures in this embedding space. And finally, we also introduce so-called spell checker, which, which allows us to control uh, how, much, uh, how much correct are the structures that we generate. And that's very important because quite often what we see uh, when we train these, uh, these models. So one, one tiny symbol in the smile string might not be a huge error for the loss function uh, when we actually train these models, but in terms of the structure that will give a completely irrelevant structure. So it's very important actually to have this additional spell correction step which we added at the end. So let's start from the generative pipeline. So from encoder and decoder, so in the very basic uh, as a case that could be a uh, autoencoder structure where we ha actually have a network encoder network which encodes a database of, uh, it could be graph database or smiles into continuous space. And then we have uh, in this continuous space, we, we have each point representing the structure. And then we want to decode from this continuous space back to the structure. So that's, that's the way how we tra train these models. So we actually have uh, some, some relevantly, uh, some rather large database, and we want to train the model to reconstruct this database. And by doing so, it actually learns to create this intermediate representation in which we can scan the space for searching for novel structures. And furthermore, we actually can go uh, to now uh, correct representation of how we actually uh, represent these discrete molecules to, to feed to neural network. And there are multiple representations that people use. So the, the most basic one is fingerprints. Uh, and this is not, not always uh, relevant for us because uh, they don't necessarily represent the unique structure. 
So a uh, good approach is actually to look on the molecular graphs, smiles, or three-dimensional renderers. However, the last one is rather complex to approach, but people use it, for example, to optimize how the particular molecule can bind to target. And in our research, we actually focus on the smile strings, which is the basic, basic representation of the molecule as a string. And in this case, we can actually apply uh, already existent natural language processing to these models to these structures. And the first, uh, the first approach that we did, we actually tried to see how, um, how well our model trains, uh, generative model trains. So, so we actually experimented how much data do we need to make our model actually uh, uh, generalize well enough. And when we start from few thousand and go to few millions of examples, we see that first we have rather large train and test uh, error gap. So we, we see that a model performs very well on train, but actually does not perform well on the test data. But if, as we move on with the uh, number of examples in the, uh, in the data sets, we actually see that this gap shrinks and, and vanishes. So it's important to, uh, to state that we still have some, some errors. So it's not zero error. So we still do errors. And these errors might be negligible in, in terms of the loss function, but this might be a few symbols incorrect in the resulting smile structure, but these few symbols will actually lead to completely wrong, uh, wrong graph. So it's important then to introduce the correction of these strings. And we do this with uh, with the help of natural language processing t techniques, and particularly here, this is a standard sequence-to-sequence -sequence model with attention mechanism. So what, what it looks like, it actually uh, so-called uh, uh, long-short-term -term memory uh, model, where we actually uh, try to feed the sequence. In our, in our, in our uh, case, that's a smile, and we want to repro uh, re reproduce this sequence. And during the training, we actually uh, add a lot of noise in the data set to actually corrupt the input se sequence and teach the model to correct this uh, sequence at, as at output. And what we do with attention, attention is important because uh, it allows the model immediately see how particular sy symbols in this, in this sequence depend on the other symbols uh, in, the, in, the, in the smile. So as a result, we see that when we generate new structures with our generator, uh, we have almost 70% of uh, unique smiles that we get corrected by this, uh, with this corrector, this spell checker. So finally, I, I just noticed that we had, uh, we had gener generator structure, which actually is encoder and decoder. We have spell checker. And these could be trained actually on the large data sets, which are available all in, in open data sets. But when we go to, uh, to real world, we actually often are limited to rather small data sets. And it's important somehow to, to train these models and still generate va valid unique structures. So what we, what we try to experiment here, we try to add a sampling technique in the embedding space on the reference data sets. And this could be done by very standard uh, oversampling techniques, which are used for imbalanced data sets. So, so we have a small data set, and we can generate a synthetic uh, structures in the embedding space. And this will be these green new, new, uh, new data points. And then we actually feed these data points into decoder and predictor of the property uh, that, we, that we get. And we also analyzed how good will be these generated molecules. And we, we looked on the, uh, whether the distribution of various functional groups, structural properties, and molecular descriptors actually are similar to what we had in the reference data set. And we see that they are actually very, very much close, but not identical, which is good for us, because that allows us to generate the unique structures, which are different from what we had in the, uh, in the training set. And we see that the substructure features do have kind of similar distribution. And we also see that the distribution of the molecular descriptors, li like molecular weights, log P, uh, or synthetic accessibility score, is, is kind of similar. So what is important that with this approach, we're also having some 
uh, reference data sets with, uh, with a good uh, synthetic accessibility score, we can actually, based on this data set, we can try to generate a new, new data which would also be uh, having a uh, low synthetic accessibility score. And finally, we, we added here predictor, which is again uh, might be trained together with sampling, uh, uh, with, with a sampler, but not end to end with the whole model. And we, we tried to predict various properties like toxicity, and this, in this example, we have uh, solubility. And we see that we can already on the small data, rather small data, we can actually have good, pred good prediction quality. And we also uh, qualified that by running molecular dynamic simulations uh, above and below the solubility limit to see if, if actually uh, the models, the molecules that we generate uh, separate well. So uh, from this, let me summarize. So we have a pipeline, and generally this pipeline could be trained end to end. So we not necessarily need to, to have different parts trained in separate, but we also can uh, leverage the available data that we have in the various sources and train different, uh, different parts of this pipeline separately and enhance, uh, and enhance its applicability in real world uh, cases. So with this, we actually can get physically correct structures. We could work on relatively small data sets and we could uh, check, uh, smile, uh, check the correct structure in the smiles based on the uh, natural language processing model, which actually can be trained on the large, uh, on the rather large data sets. And uh, having this uh, this model in place, we also decided to have a little bit of fun. So we we uh, we wanted to uh, generate now the structure and visualize it. And for that, we actually used uh, augmented reality. Uh, where we actually build a solution which allows you to assess the geometrical properties of these molecules, see how it's, uh, what is the spatial structure of it, and you can actually play with this uh, demo here on our stand. So this is uh, all from my side. Very thank you for attention. We have quite a bit of time for questions, so. Thank you for the talk. Uh, my question uh, would be, when you have a predicted structure, what is your experience with actually trying to synthesize that structure? Uh, in, in the current setting, we actually uh, did not try to synthesize it yet, but that's uh, something uh, which we want to do as the next steps. We want to collaborate with laboratories who can actually try to synthesize it. And for, for that reason, we actually started from the numerical experiment, basically molecular dynamics. And from molecular dynamics, we see that we can actually reproduce, exact, at least on the solubility side, we see that our predictors work well. So we, we see that above and below the solubility, we can more or less predict the right solubility. Yeah. Uh, very interesting talk. Um, I assume that the, the, the experimentation that you have done is limited to small molecule, or have you also done for the peptide? Uh, we, we are limited currently f to the small molecules, okay. uh, below uh, 60 symbols in smiles, uh, but uh, we can actually extend this mm -hmm. very much. And my second question is very philosophical, very close to me. Do you believe that, uh, or do you think the smile is the most efficient way of uh, representing the chemical and chemical space, or do, do, what, what is your idea about uh, embedding? Uh, uh, yeah, space? so actually, uh, on uh, like, <laughs> yeah, from the philosophical point of view, mm -hmm. I would really uh, say that graph representation is That's much better, mm -hmm. and training graph, uh, graph network, uh, networks on the graphs would mm -hmm. be much more efficient, but what we see right now is that is very much dependent on the data sets. Not that much on the representation, but actually on the data sets. Yeah. And we don't see as, more, as much re improvement by going from one representation to another. As Thank you. Actually, by just increasing the mm -hmm. data set. Yeah. Works better. Yeah, we have a question there. Just to follow up on that question, can you comment on how you're handling stereochemical complexity? Uh, synthetic accessibility score or what? So obviously with smile strings, you can't represent complex stereochemistry. Yeah. So 
to follow up, can you kind of comment on how you're planning to build that into your model? Mm, I think that we, we can probably discuss that uh, later on because I don't really uh, get this question. But, uh, yeah. How long does it take from beginning um, to end to output? Yeah, so actually the advantage of this uh, approach is that it's, it takes fraction of seconds, so it's very fast. Or you mean from the beginning of training to, to actually getting... Well, now the model's generating. trained. Once we have the model's trained, it takes fraction of seconds to right. generate as many uh, smiles as we need. So not, uh, not extensive amount, but still... And if I understand from one of the questions, from s you have not yet synthesized one of the molecules, and therefore you haven't gone through biophysical binding. Yep. Validation, okay. Yep. But that would be very interesting, actually, to, to go on in this interaction. How, yep. how big do you find this continuous space has to be? How? The, uh, your, uh, your continuous space after the encoding, yep. how big in terms of dimensionality is, is that? Do you find that has to be? Uh, well. If, if you are asking in terms of feature, uh, if the, of the dimensionality of the feature vector, so we, ha we used here a dimensionality of 512. Um, so that was just like, uh, from experimental point of view, optimal number. Um, but that we, we can actually play with that quite a lot. But it's very much, again, it's very much depends on the sparsity of the data set that you have. So the, the highest dimensionality, the more spiky your, uh, uh, your data will be. Are there any other questions or comments? Or we can get to our coffee break a little bit quicker. All right, thank you. Thank you.